Those buildings which were fortunate enough to survive the disastrous Great Fire of Warwick in 1694 have since had to adapt to the changing needs of the town. The Guildhall of 1383 became the Lord Leicester Hospital and is now a home for ex-servicemen. Oaken's House is a later timber frame building that's also seen several changes of use. But the one feature that dominates the landscape around Warwick is undoubtedly the castle. In a commanding position on the north bank of the Avon, it's regarded as the finest surviving medieval castle in the country. It's also one of the most popular among visitors both from home and abroad. Last year, nearly 700,000 people trod these ramparts and heard how William the Conqueror, just two years after the Battle of Hastings, decided to make Warwick his stronghold here in the heart of England. Some of those original parts of the castle still remain, but it's been much added to and restored in its 900-year history. The castle also houses an enviable collection of arms and armour, reflecting the many turbulent centuries it shared with its owners, the Earls of Warwick. Perhaps none more so than the 15th century, when during the Wars of the Roses, the 16th Earl, Richard Neville, anxious to be on the right side, fought on both sides and unfortunately ended up dead on the wrong side. As always, we've had to find a hall big enough for the many hundreds of people we expect to see today, and we've come a few miles away to the Arts Centre at the University of Warwick. But we hope that today will prove to be a special event for the Antiques Roadshow and the people of this part of Warwickshire. How did you start collecting them? Well, it was my wife's collection, actually, and she took an interest in these before she went on to dolls and toys and things and we used to go around the antique shops. We found Bath a particularly good hunting ground. You've got a fantastic collection here. I mean, a Chatelaine, of course, they actually date back to the Roman times. They were, uh, the Romans actually uh, had, had Chatelaines, and they were particularly popular in the 19th century. Of course, uh, they, they sort of died a death when uh, women started to wear big pockets in their skirts. I mean, the, the object of a Chatelaine, of course, is to hang um, the hook onto the belt and have all this lot suspended below. Uh, but they're absolutely wonderful. I mean, you've got here, you've got the little mesh purse for the coins. Um, the little pail there, of course, is for the pins to go in. Um, a little pomander, and of course, a vinaigrette. Even, even the fob watch. And of course, scissors, of course, very often these were lost and you had replacement scissors put into them. But the whole thing is wonderful. It's a marvellous collection. It would be 19th century, wouldn't it? Oh, yes, indeed. I mean, this one, I mean, uh, the silver, silver marks on the top here would date that for us. I mean, that's about 1893. Well, how many more of these do you have? 34. And that, again... But I these, I reckon, say, are the best. Can you remember how much you paid for them in sixes? I think we bought them all between £4 and £10 each. £20 each. Well, you can't buy a good Chatelaine these days, certainly under £300. So, taking them all in all, I should think you're probably, your collection's probably worth, without going through the whole lot, probably five or six thousand pounds. So, they were a wonderful investment at the time, anyway. She was given to my mother when I was born, mm. as um, a present sort of thing, and my mother kept her, sort of, she always used to sit in the rocking chair at home, and she wasn't, we just didn't play with her. Oh, good. Well, you can see the bits that haven't been exposed yes. really are very nice, aren't I mean, they? why are the legs yellow like this? I mean, have they been painted or They something? look as if they've been had some, some restoration, actually. Now, with any doll, best place to start, if it's a bisque-headed yes, doll, yeah. is the back of the head. There we are. K-star R, Simon and Halbig, 117. Now, that tells me that it was made by a company called Kammer and Reinhardt. German company, they were uh, based in Walterhausen in Thuringia and they set up in business in the 1880, 1886 they set up in business. And in 1895 they started using this star in their trademark, but it was only uh, later that they started to produce dolls like this. Now look at this face because it's not what I would call a typical dolly face. And when you look at a face like this, the first thing that you should think is, well, perhaps it's based on a character. Now, these character faces 
didn't start until 1909. So we can date her quite accurately. reasonably accurately. We know that she cannot be before well, 1909. We were always told that she came over just before the First World War. Could well have yes. been, yes. Yeah. The one problem that she has is around here, there's obviously been a crack to the to the neck which has been mended. Can you see? Oh, yes, yeah. The good thing, I suppose, is that the crack hasn't affected her face. No. I mean, and that is the most important thing. She has this very nice ball-jointed body, and it's always a good sign when they have joints at the wrist and the elbow, as well as at the knee and hip. She's not absolutely perfect with this chip out of her neck, but even so, I'm certain that she'd be worth between 800 and 1,200 pounds. She's just wonderful. She is, she's lovely. I mean, we've always loved her. Mm. And it's nice to know that something like that is worth yes. money as well. Oh, she's I, lovely. I do think that you could perhaps add a little bit to her by getting rid of that <laughs> yes. dress. Thank you very yes. much. Thank you very much. What we're looking at appears to be a very early George I period, Walnut Bureau, of the most desirable model. These were made, a few of them were made, in the 1710, 1725 period. Um, this fantastic shape, beautiful cabriol legs, a big solid ball and claw foot. It has all the elements, all the features that you'd expect to see uh, on a piece of that period. Have you had it a long time as a family piece or...? Well, it's been in the family since the late 20s, early 30s. And my son owns it now, and it was his grandmother who bought it. These things are so rare that they have to prove themselves innocent. Yes. You know, they yes. are suspect. Yes. You've got, firstly, when you open it, signs of wear, which is always nice to see. See those little yes. circular marks where the door has oh, opened. Caught. Yes. Now, the only trouble is, that one's slightly suspicious that such a wonderful piece of furniture should be made of such a rough old bit of wood mm. on the inside. So we now really start to look a little more carefully at it. I'm going to pull a drawer out, nice little drawers. We've got some ink on there. Usually, we've got some ink on that one too. This is very dusty. I'll tell him. This is actually what is called in the trade rotten dust. This is a mixture of cement powders and various others which uh, people put on to make it look older than it is. I'll leave that one up there for a second. Have a look at the main drawer. We've got some more ink. We're now starting to look rather carefully at an awful lot of ink stains in all the drawers. Yes. Now that's a little suspicious. So we then have to look at the surface itself. The dirt has been applied, in this case, not just dry dust, but wet. And you can see where somebody has rubbed along. And then, fatal mistake, actually put his fingers on there, close the drawer. Do you see? Yes. Yes. So now we've got a piece that's actually been faked mm -hmm. to look older than it is, mm -hmm. right? And this piece was made not in 1720, but in 1920. Oh. 1910 to 1920, just after the First World War, in fact. Yes. Now, having said all that, it is a very good example of its type. They are still being made today, not fake to this extent, but they're still being made today as reproduction pieces, and they cost a great deal of money. This little bureau would cost you to replace four and a half to five thousand pounds. Absolutely. Absolutely. Even, even as a early 20th century reproduction piece. Very, very interesting. I think there's probably more to say about it than about an original. Now this picture's by N.H. Christensen. I think that's Niels H. Christensen, but I, I find it I find it rather intriguing because Christensen is an artist that I've been aware of for some time and uh, whose work appears regularly at auction. And he's obviously an accomplished painter, but we know very little about him. Although some of the books describe him as Swedish, he is in fact Danish. He was Danish, yes, yes. He was born in Jutland in about uh, 1820. Yes. And then he came to England in about 1850. Right. And he died in... Uh, 1922. Really? 
how do you know so much about him? Because he's my grandfather. Oh, he's your grandfather? Yes, yes. And he's known as the snowman because of his snow scenes. I think we've got a little one here, actually, yes. haven't we? And it's got these rather mysterious letters, R-A-C, after his name. I, I've, I've often wondered what they stood for, if you've got any ideas. I was told it was the uh, Royal Academy of Copenhagen. Oh, well, that would make sense, in a way, because that would... Um, he put it sort of in, in English in order to explain himself to the English public, yes. perhaps. Yes. He didn't particularly need the letters to justify himself, because when you look at a picture of this impressiveness, you could see what a, what, a, what a good and accomplished painter he was. Apparently, he was well known for the amount of detail that he put into his paintings. Um, for instance, if you look there, you'll find there's a fishing net. Very, very detailed. What is typical of him also is this moonlit light and the artificial lights coming out rather cosily of uh, this cottage. It's interesting that he came here and obviously did make a big impression from the number of pictures that one does find in English collections and that do come on the market. If one were trying to put a value on it, I have not been aware of uh, Christensen making more than, I think, about £1,700 is the highest price I remember, and I think that this must be in that area. Conceivably, if this ever came up at auction, it would beat the world record for a painting by Christensen, but I think it sort of should be insured for two, two and a half thousand pounds. Yes. Jolly nice one. Three little figurines, all from the Royal Worcester factory. Are these something which you collect particularly? Not really, no, no. Um, in fact, I didn't know if these two were Worcester. Oh. Um, I, I knew he was. Well, this one uh, is the earliest of them and would date from the little late Victorian period. This is a candle extinguisher rather than a simple figure. It's hollow based and the idea was to put it over a candle and it would cut out the oxygen and nice. snuff out the, the flame. And the model known as Granny Snow, um, model in the 1850s, tradition in Worcester that it was an old lady who lived near the Worcester factory and terrorised the workmen and they made yeah. a caricature of, of her looking somewhat fierce, lady in surprise, but a little novelty. Uh, an unusual thing, shame about the damage on the hand, that means yeah. she's probably still worth about 40 or 50 pounds in that condition. Uh, next we have really quite a, a, an uncommon model, which are very seldom seen, that of Bonzo. Mm. You, you know the cartoon yes. dog, um, the creation of George Study, uh, tremendously popular in the 1920s and early 30s. When this was made, it, it'll have a date code on the bottom for the actual year of manufacture. Uh, the little mark shows a little symbol there, which is 1929. Mm. And that was when they introduced this model, first of all. And they made him as a pepper pot, intentionally, with holes cut in his head. Uh, and that's normally how we see him. And they made a few of them without the holes, which I think is much nicer looking, but yes, are yeah. extremely rare. And he's going to be 200, 250 pounds. As much as that. I'm amazed. Yeah, the third little figurine is rather odd. Because this figurine is the sort of piece that was mainly decorated by workmen in, in the factory in their own time. It was a white figure. It went wrong in the making. Probably the head got broken off when yeah. it was being made. And it was taken home by the workmen who painted it themselves. This isn't factory colouring. It's uh, quite an uncommon figure by Frida Doughty from a little series of, of children of, of different costumes of countries of the world. And um, very few of that particular figure were made. But it had problems being not a factory production. If that had been a fully finished or coloured factory piece, it would be... £350, £400. Pounds. Sadly unfinished, it's still about £30 or £40. Pounds. Mm -hmm. But together they make the beginnings of a fascinating collection of uncommon Worcester pieces. Oh, that was fascinating, thank you very much. But this is a little dog, a stuffed dog. Oh! And he's real. He was three years old. Oh, they all know his toy dogs. Yeah, but he wasn't, because he had normal parents. Him and his brother and his sister were the same size. Well, he's really, really no bigger than a hamster. Imagine having that on your feet all day long. And so then, then he was stuffed and married to the children of his last day. Very nice. When they reach the riverbank, the thief has gone, they draw a blank. And Rupert says, I dare not stay, I must get home without delay. I mean, it's just exactly the same sort of recipe, isn't it, as you get today, and it's just absolutely charming. All of these children's books are now becoming more and more collectible, and I think it was Rupert books that started the whole thing off. Um, now, the first Rupert annual, I think these days, is worth around about sort of 90, 100 pounds. So this was a Christmas present from your parents? Yes, yeah. fine. And you were a keen Uncle fan? Oh, I was a big fan, yeah. 
it was a great success when it came out in the mid 60s on the television and of course it's come back now and the great thing about this is you must have played with it extremely well because it comes in the original attache case and it's complete with the exception of the pen but you've still got the wallet oh and you've still got the file of um invisible ink very nice my feeling is that even without the pen you're looking at a set that is going to be worth in the region of a couple of hundred pounds. This is really what is so lovely about this table, isn't it? Yes. Now, how long have you had this? And, and tell me what uh, you know about it. 57 years. We were farmers. And across one field from us, this gentleman lived. And suddenly the, the husband died. So um, she, they had a two-day sale. And I, I always took the milk and everything over, you know. So Mum said she'd like to buy me something out of there. So uh, she went to the sale and this was the result. Well, I think you've, you've got something very, very nice yeah. from, from that sale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's interesting because this sort of, of decoration is really from Italy. The, yeah. the workshops were set up in Florence in the 16th century. Yeah. And from that time onwards, this kind of decoration was very much sought after by British tourists yeah. uh, going to Italy, particularly to Florence and Rome. Yeah. But I think this is a particularly charming yeah. example mm. from the, probably from the second half of the 19th century. And it has this very pretty garland yes. of flowers and yeah. leaves going yeah. all the way around it. Yeah. But the perhaps most effective piece is the vase with the doves that is in the middle here. In fact, there was a, a workshop, well, there were workshops in Derbyshire that made marble, inlaid marble pieces as well. But one of the reasons I think this is definitely an Italian piece is the inclusion of uh, malachite, for instance, here in the butterfly, and something else which is also quite exotic, if you like, and that's lapis lazuli here, which was a very precious stone and was used uh, by Renaissance painters to make the, the colour of the gowns for the, the Virgin Mary in their paintings. And those are used on the butterflies and some of the flowers, which really gives it a richness. And so this is something that, that you treasure and wouldn't, wouldn't want to get rid of. No, I wouldn't get rid of this. My poor old mum bought it in it. Yes. Not for all the world, I would. Well, I think it'd be a lovely piece to keep in the family. Yes. It does have a considerable market value, things like this, which are extremely decorative. Yes. And at auction, you might expect to, to get around £3,000 yes. for something like this. And I'm sure you will continue to get a great deal of pleasure out of yes. this one. I'm sure I shall. <laughs> Thank you. Well, now, once again, to our competition and your chance to win a voucher to the value of £2,500, which you can then spend on antiques of your choice. And an additional prize this year, all our lucky winners will be receiving one of these enamel boxes as a, a memento of the antiques ratio. But first, the answer to last week's competition. And the question was, at around what date was this fire screen made? And the answer is 1720. And so to this week's magnificent competition object, which comes from Warwick Castle, where we were a little earlier today. It's this magnificent vase, dates from around 1770, and the base material is a mineral called Blue John, which is mined in Derbyshire, and this rich purple colour and vivid translucent appearance is absolutely typical of Blue John, a wonderful mineral in my view. It's all vividly set off with this uh, gilded metalwork, comprising basically two classical figures supporting these candelabra and then here in the center a swag of leaves uh, and fruit. Now this metalwork decoration is known as Ormolu and the whole thing was the work of a silversmith and metalwork manufacturer from Birmingham who briefly was the biggest producer of Ormolu in Britain. And that leads me to the question, what was his name? Was it Christopher Pinchbeck, George Elkington, James Cox, Matthew Bolton or Paul Storr? Now, if you'd like to take part in the competition, you can enter on a postcard, but your entry must be in the post, please, by next Saturday, and address to Antiques Roadshow Competition, P.O. Box 161, Northampton, NN3, 1ZZ. 
And if you'd like a copy of the rules, then please enclose a stamped addressed envelope to the same address. Best of luck with that. The winner, by the way, is the first correct entry out of the hat. Well, I'll be giving the answer and setting another competition object at the same time next week. Uh, these are my husband's relatives. Uh, this is Vice Admiral Sir Richard Grindall, who um, was a captain at the time of the Battle of Trafalgar and commanded the Prince. The annoying thing about um, this particular painting is I just don't know who it's by at the moment. I would have thought it's painted about 1800. And I think that uh, it's enchanting portraiture of his children, his wife. And I particularly like the neoclassical setting, the house in which they're in. Um, there are one or two elements just in the furniture. Uh, for instance, this lovely desk and chair here. Other things, this splendid fitted carpet. It's not just a rug, but it's actually a fitted carpet. Even though it has elements of flowers, these colours of greens and reds and so on do show a strong kind of Pompeian influence. And of course, at the end of the 18th century, the discoveries of antiquity yes. in Rome, and there was a whole interest in the revival and, of course, the neoclassical interest. Now, this gentleman here appears to be um, ready to go to sea as a midshipman, and he's got his cap there. Yes. Now, who's he? He is Horatio Grindall who was a midshipman on the victory, but at the time of Trafalgar was a lieutenant, and I believe died on the victory. Oh, He's the eldest son. Um, I don't know anything about those two at all. Again, trying to come back to the attribution, who actually painted it. Just hope that one day, that one can come up with a name for the artist. Yes. Now, on the question of its value, I would have thought, probably for insurance purposes, that you ought to think of something between the region of 10 or 15,000 pounds. And of course, the sentimental and kind of historical interest of you probably actually surpasses that. Yes, yes. Do you know what they are? No, I don't. You've never had any idea? None whatsoever. Well, they are in the form of Japanese Netsuke. Right. Uh, little toggle worn at the waistband. And the Japanese used them to suspend a pouch or a little box called an inro from the waist because they didn't have pockets. Right. Um, Let's move back in date order. This is the earliest one. And he's, in fact, a little figure of a Dutchman. Dutchman were sort of figures of fun. Uh -huh. I mean, they were really bizarre, these tall people. Uh, Japanese very small. Yes. Um, and they actually used to come from all over Japan in the 17th century just to take a gl glimpse of a Dutchman. This one is in late 18th century in date. Um, he's going to be worth somewhere in the order of um, 150 to 200 pounds. Oh, really? Yeah. Gosh. A little shock, yeah? I shall give him pride of place. Now, this one is not a Netsuki, no holes. He's an okimono, just a little standing figure to amuse the export market for the oh, tourists I after see. they gave up net wearing Netsuki. Right. And it's a boy with a, I think it's supposed to be a musical instrument called a koto. Yeah. Um, he dates much nearer to 1900. And he's worth about 30 to 40 pounds. This one is very poor quality. I yes. mean, this really is the bottom end. It's rough, holes in it, very poor quality. He's worth very little. But this one is very, very well carved and attractive group. And it's a, a baby, and of course, that's a good subject. Yes. And you've got a cat, and cats are very rare in Japanese iconography. You don't find them very often. Oh, is that right? Well, no, they were actually considered bad luck, oh. funnily enough. Oh, oh. Um, but uh, he's beautifully carved. Yes. Um, detail is fine. There's no damage on it. And there's the... a gorgeous little foot. Well, that's always a good sign. If they oh, bothered to spend lovely. a lot of effort on yes, the bottom. Yes. And this signature on a red lacquer reserve. Now, there's a sort of mythology about red lacquer reserves that if you've got something signed on a red lacquer reserve, it means it's good quality. That's mm -hmm. not right, because they did do dreadful ones on red lacquer reserves. Oh, but right. on the whole, the best ones do yeah. have red lacquer reserves, right. yeah. Um, and it's sewn, signed Joe Ray. Joe Ray. <laughs> Joe Ray. <laughs> uh, unusual name, actually. <laughs> it's, it's a very good little group. I think he would probably make somewhere in the order of 700 to 1,000 oh, pounds. Really? Yes. That's amazing. Yeah. We've had it in our church for an awfully long time, probably since it was made. Since it's been, oh yes, yes, I'm sure. And it lives in the bank, unfortunately, yes. most of the time. Yes.
This was made um, around about 1570. The only place that I know that makes communion cups with this strange little flange that looks almost like an Elizabethan ruff is up here in the Midlands and specifically at Coventry. Um, now, in the 1570s, there were three different people making communion cups for the local area. One of them used the mark of a rose. One of them used the mark IF. And one of them used the mark of a cross. Regrettably, this one has got no marks on at all, so we have to guess. But I'm sure this is the man whose mark was a rose. He used, more often than not, this bucket-shaped bowl. It was he who really specialised in this little flange, and he who was very keen on what I call this sort of hit-and-miss ornament. It's, it's a series of little hyphens um, within the typical Elizabethan interlaced strap work that you get on practically every Elizabethan communion cup that exists. Given that this was made for the parish in 1570-ish, if you lost it, is, it is it's basically irreplaceable and I think it's very sensible sometimes to insure it for the sort of price that you would get a real craftsman artist goldsmith to come along and design something for you today. I would think probably he would make you one for 800 to 1,000 pounds. If this had the rose mark on it, you could say that arguably the thing would be worth double, maybe even two and a half times that. But I think it's wonderful. Thank you so much for bringing it along. Really thrilled to have had a little play with it. Well, wonderful. Delighted to bring it. <laughs> Thank you. These are fantastic. And one, um... Well, these are very, very early postcards. I mean, they're before 1902, because you can see on the back, it isn't divided to say address on one side and message on the other, like a, a postcard is today. You were supposed to write your message just on the front here. That was the only place for the message, and then the whole of the other side was taken up with the address. These are very early. They are very good. They're fantastic. Look at these. And these are by the very, by an extremely good maker. These are by Raphael Tuck and Son, who were the Rolls-Royce printers of postcards. These cards are worth a minimum of five pounds each. I would have thought you must have at least 150. This is one of the most exciting collections of postcards I've seen. Now, you may remember a few weeks ago, we were in Kingsbridge in Devon, and a gentleman came in with two very fine drawings, which he'd been told were by Titian and Veronese, respectively. Now, Peter Nahum was our expert that day who looked at them, and he was by no means 100% certain, but he did undertake to do some more research. Well, that research on the two pictures is now complete. Peter's joined us again here in Warwick, together with the owner, uh, to deliver the verdict. Well, firstly, we know it comes from the Earl of Spencer's collection, which was formed in the 18th century, and, uh, as far as I can tell, largely dispersed in the 19th century. In fact, this particular drawing uh, turned up in one of the Spencer sales at the beginning of the 19th century. And this drawing was sold um, as a Titian, an important Titian, and made a lot of money then. Doesn't sound a lot now, but it made 14 pounds and 10 shillings. The point about the Venetian school it, is that, as a whole, the school has not been very popular. And it wasn't popular in the 19th century, and it really hasn't been popular until well after the Second World War, until quite recently. This drawing, in fact, relates to um, a painting by Veronese, Paolo Veronese, painted in about 1565, entitled Venus and uh, Adonis. Uh, in fact, the compositional elements of the painting are changed around. Now, this would perhaps lead us to believe that this, not being, if you like, an accurate copy of the painting, was a preparatory drawing for this Veronese. But I have taken independent opinions from scholars, and they all seem to think that it relates probably to Veronese's younger brother, and he probably drew it some 30 years later. Veronese had a very large circle of artists working around him, and, and his school went on long after his death. So it is still, if you like, an enormous quagmire 
which the scholars haven't quite worked out. Also, everybody agrees that it's a very beautiful drawing. Unfortunately, this doesn't make it a very expensive drawing. Its insurance value would be around £5,000. Now, the second drawing is also very interesting because it's also taught me a great deal. This, uh, it turns out, is not by a Venetian hand, but almost certainly uh, a hand of a Frenchman or uh, a Belgian or a uh, Flemish hand. Again, it's Veronese school and was drawn probably in Venice, but about a hundred years later or something like that. Its value, again, I'm afraid is not high at all. Um, the consensus of opinion is that it's under a thousand pounds at this point in time. But as I say, this is modern scholarship and the Veronese, the whole Veronese school is still in the melting pot. Well, I'm very grateful to you for all the trouble that you've done and all the investigations. It's been very, very interesting. It's completely different to my researches of some years ago, some 40 years ago. That's exactly when uh, all these, the scholarship hadn't really begun and so many drawings were given to Titian, which yeah. have been debunked. Thank you very much once again. It is very ornate. It's quite difficult to display if, uh, if it's too near on the furniture. I find it a little bit strange because of, of, of the variety of detail on it, but I have great sentimental attachment to it. Well, that's obviously, it's a family piece, is it? It's, it's been in the family for a while. My mother actually bought it about 30 years ago. Yes. It really is what I would call a toy, because it's very small in scale, isn't it? And I think it, it's what, in the later 19th century, would have been considered a wonderful boudoir piece. It has everything about it that is the 19th century Madame's idea of what Marie Antoinette might have had in her boudoir, which is why much of it reflects late 18th century French taste. We can see that, in fact, it's made of a gilt wood, and originally it would have been sparkling with gold, imitating solid gold. But in fact, it's on a wooden core. We can see here, just where a little bit of moulding has uh, come away, that the wooden core is covered with white gesso, which gives a good brown for the gold leaf, which is then applied over the top here. And you have uh, all sorts of things piled onto it. So you have this lower mirror, complete with a little foot cushion. I think, I think that's what it must be. You delicately place your, your toe on the cushion while you're powdering your face uh, at the, 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 the mirror above. So it's all, all the classical detail you associate with Marie Antoinette's boudoir. But there are details in it which don't somehow relate to Marie Antoinette. For instance, the sphinxes that you have up here on the drawers. And perhaps the whole structure of this, this part here is a little bit less French 18th century than, than you might think. But what is lovely here, you come across this top and into the middle to a little porcelain plaque painted with, again, a rather 18th century style lady who's handling a fan in a rather coquettish manner. And why that is so nice is that if you go up a little bit further, you then find that the mirror, this beveled mirror, is formed out of two staffs into a, a lovely, delightful fan shape so that the decoration of the plaque is echoed in the decoration of the mirror. And again, in the trophy on the top here, you find that there is the indication of uh, a mirror and a fan again. So there's a lot of, lot of thought, a lot of detail put into this little piece. And I think it, when, when it was brightly gilded, it, it really would have been absolutely delightful. It's something that I think you, you probably need to ensure. It has got some damage on the top but I think you, you should think in the region of £3,000 for insurance and really worthwhile to do that. Because of the fragility of these pieces, there aren't that many still around. Aren't they? <laughs> that is interesting. And my own mother was told when she bought it that it actually came probably from one of the Grace and Cover apartments at Hampton Court Palace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it would come out of the palace itself. Ah, oh, well, yeah. there you are. It is a, it's, it's a, a boudoir palace piece. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very Lovely. Much. Thank you. Oh, I like it. I like it a lot. It's an absolutely classic example of what we would call a Borden tube type barometer. Let's look at the dial first of all. It's paper. The reason is that no. then the outer bit can easily just be popped on in various different languages. Because, as you can see from here, the thing was designed by a Frenchman called Borden. And it yes. says E. Borden and Richards. And they won a gold medal 
at an exhibition in Paris in 1849. And then over there I see we've got a similar exhibition medal for the uh, London Fair of 1851. Well, Mr. Borden really invented this particular principle, and it was the forerunner to the aneroid barometer. Well, the uh, present day. The present day aneroid, and basically that is uh, a circular capsule, which is of corrugated form, yeah. partially evacuated of air, and that it acts like a bellows through a linkage to give you a change of atmospheric pressure. Yeah. And there is a horseshoe-shaped thing in there, which is a brass construction, and that basically moves in and out to bear on this wonderful rack, which, if I can just move it very briefly, then shifts mm -hmm. across onto this pinion, and then you get a superb register of scale. Now, I have to say that we can date it pretty much because of these dates. We know it was made, or the patent was, was well prior to uh, 1849, and we know that this particular example was probably retailed in about 1860. Oh, yeah. And very, very soon after that, really by the 1870s, the aneroid had completely taken over. So technically, this is a bit of fun. Oh. I've always liked it, and that's why I bought it. When, when did you buy it? About 20 years ago, I think. So that was sort of mid-70s, I mean, roughly what you paid, you remember? Uh, ten pounds, I think. That's pretty good news, because, frankly, this sort of barometer and early aneroids have soared in the market over the last mm -hmm. ten to fifteen years. And something like this at the moment, although not magnificently high-valued, <laughs> would certainly see you at auction in the region of 200 to 250 pounds. Oh. So, oh, well. Pretty good investment on your oh, tenner. yes. Very nice. Thank you. I like that. <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> fantastic toy. It's made of tin and the size is extraordinary. The actual design with these two scholars is, is very unusual and it's in super condition. Now there, there must be a story behind this. Whose is it? Well there isn't really, no. <laughs> no, it was bought at an auction in Leamington probably about 30 years ago. By uh, you? Or? No, by my father. Right. And I mean, it's actually quite a sculptural object as well as anything else, isn't it? Um, wonderfully finished with this fake wood on both the hull and on the little rudder at the other end. The figures themselves are articulated. I suppose they would, they would go backwards and forwards. Oh, there we go. Backwards and forwards and actually move the oars. Um, the date is... Quite early, I would say that it's dating from around 1905, 1908. And the maker's mark is actually in here. And it is the letters GBN inside rings. And that tells me that it was made by a company called Gebruder Bing of Nuremberg. Now, they are one of the very best manufacturers. Uh, they were operating at what is known as the golden age of tin toy manufacture, which was between 1900 and 1910. The thing about tin plate boats, they don't seem to have survived in very large numbers. I think probably most of them ended up at the bottom of ponds or at the bottom of the sea. Or, In fact, I'm very tempted to, to dredge the round pond in Kensington. I'm sure you'd find some wonderful boats there. Um, so this has a lot of things going for it and it's going to be worth a lot of money. Uh, we're talking about perhaps between 1,200 and 1,500 pounds. It's wonderful, thanks so much for bringing it in. What a lovely little picture this is. Have you seen it out of its frame before? Only once. I ask you whether you've seen it out of its frame before because hidden under the edge of the frame, just up here, is this tiny little signature and a date. Oh, oh, I see. Have you ever seen that before? No, I haven't seen that before, no. It is signed Canella who was a Italian painter, Giuseppe Canella, yes. who worked in Paris in the 1820s and 1830s. And I see actually just below, very, very indistinctly, there is a little date, 1830. There we've got quite a significant date, I suppose, 1830. It was the date of the restoration of the monarchy. Yes. And the artist has depicted a lot of figures in a sort of political turmoil there. You see, Wonderful detail when you get into it. Um, a line of regular and irregular soldiers, I suppose you'd describe it, coming along here. And I don't know if you've ever noticed that it's wonderful characterization. Here they are, 
marching along under the tricolor, passing these three splendid, rather dandified figures who watch them in a rather disdainful fashion. Lots of other good characters along here. These two women giggling in the corner. There's so much going on in there. Have you ever looked into it in detail? No, you've <laughs> given a new insight into it. I think I need a magnifying glass, really. Well, it is, when you get into it, it is absolutely really magnificently fun. done. Um, the architecture, which he was well known for, he was well known as a painter of architecture. But uh, here he's doing something that I hadn't seen him do quite as well ever before, and that is this detail in the figures, this human interest in the figures at a very crucial historical moment. It's a really lovely thing. Has it been hanging in your house for a long time? Uh, quite a long time in my house, but it's been in the family for a very long time. Has it? Because it originally belonged... Well, I got it through my grandfather, but I think it belonged to my great-grandfather. Well, it's an unusual picture to find um, here, here in Warwick, I, uh, a picture of this significant moment in French history in, yes. in, in Paris. I hope you've got it insured. <laughs> well, it's insured with the general contents, yes. Oh, what that means? <laughs> that, means, that means that if it burnt down tomorrow, you probably wouldn't get more than £500 back for it. I feel you should go straight back and uh, revise your insurance, yeah. because um, the last one by Giuseppe Canella that came up at auction of a Parisian scene, similar to this, fetched £14,000. And uh, while I think this is possibly slightly smaller, I think that uh, you should certainly think consider a sum of £12,000 for insurance. And uh, if you sold it, you might get up to anything between eight and £12,000 for it. Oh, well, my insurance broker's coming next week, so that will cheer her up in any way. I'm delighted you'll... <laughs> Depress me to some extent <laughs> <You'll>... <laughs> with a new premium. <laughs> Well, I must say our day here at the University of Warwick has proved yet again the unpredictable nature of the Antiques Roadshow. There was no reason at all when we began this morning why we should have anticipated such an excellent day on pictures, but that's the way things have been. We've seen some very fine paintings indeed. Now, I particularly hope that you'll join us next week because we're off to Kingston. Not, I hasten to add, Kingston-upon-Thames, but Kingston, Jamaica. So we wonder what surprises lie in store for us in the Caribbean. So do join us then. In the meantime, from all of us here in the West Midlands, goodbye.